Hello YouTube. So I'm partway through designing and building my own multi-sensor. Uh, my idea is that this will be the multi-sensor to trump all other multi-sensors available on the market. Uh, the idea grew from the need to have a presence sensor in every room so that the lights will turn on automatically when you walk in. But of course, like all the ideas that you've been gestating upon for years and years, uh, they quickly become more and more wacky and brilliant the more you work on them. So I set about designing the housing and the first thing I wanted to do was to standardise on the cheapest type of back box um, because uh, these are freely available. Um, they're actually a standard square light switch back box for plasterboard and we've got these here in the UK and I'm sure they exist elsewhere. Uh, here's the double width version or we call it the two gang. Um, and this particular one is 45 mil depth. Um, so if you imagine this is a square, then that's what I'm working to. These ones have got little lugs that push in and when you screw your faceplate onto the front, it pulls the lugs up and grips the back box um, onto the plasterboard. Um, so you can bring your own wire into the back through one of these knockouts and fill it with incumescent caulk to make sure that they are fire rated. Now, rather than just a single piece front plate that screws on, instead I designed a two-part housing, which I've called the back plate and the front plate. Um, I suppose they're more boxes than plates, but um, basically the back plate sits flush on your ceiling um, like this, and it screws into the back box using the, um, you know, the screws that are provided with a back box, probably, I think they're three mil or two and a half mil machine screws. Um, anyway, via these two screw holes here, uh, which are a standard spacing of 60 mil apart. Um, then the front plate has all the electronics on it with a cutout for the sensors, which I haven't done yet. And this is just a plain one. Um, and it uses a twist lock mechanism to attach to the back plate. Um, so as you can see, the design is modular, which means we can make various different front plates with different designs, different openings or whatever, um, and use the same back plate. Um, so I'll talk you through the design of this in Fusion 360. So this is the back plate, and if I just turn this sketch off, we can see it more clearly. So the opening in the back plate is just so that you can coil a wire up in your back box. You've got that additional 45 mil of depth um, sunk into the ceiling that you can actually use. Um, so you can coil your cat six up or whatever. Um, the thickness of this box is two and a half mil, as in the thickness of the material is two and a half mil, which is not over the top, but quite decent. Um, the this height is over two and a half mil. I'll just give you a bit more meat to screw into. I'm not sure why I've double chamfered, chamfered these um, instead of a single chamfer, but it just gives a lot of strength doing it that way. Um, so the side ventilation holes, originally I was only gonna have one line of holes and this entire nub section was much further down. Um, but then a friend of mine suggested putting an LED strip on the outside, which, I mean, you can't see the LED strip um, directly, obviously, because the front plate goes over it, you see. Um, but what it means is that you can put the LED strip around there and I've got these little clips which look like this. See that? And we can just print as many of these as you like. That's the shape of the clip and it goes through the hole and it, you can pull them apart and pull them out, out again. That's just because the adhesive that is supplied on most LED strips is, you know, it seems to work for a year and then falls off. Um, so that's not very good. So you can have as many of those around the circumference as you like, which I think is quite a nice detail. Um, it's a 10 mil gap for an LED strip. So most LED strips I think are exactly 10 mil wide. So they fit perfectly. And it means you can line it up against this chamfered edge and it's just, it goes on bang straight, which is quite nice. This is a little five mil height hole for um, a wire, a triple wire. So I'm using individually addressable LED strips, this SK6812, which allows me to have lights kind of going round in a circle and doing fun patterns. Um, I'm gonna be using WLED for that, which is the software, um, uh, as well as Tasmota. So I'll have two um, microcontrollers in, inside here. Probably I'll run WLED on the ESP01 and Tasmota on an ESP32. Um, but yeah, so you can see that's got a little filleted edge there. So the wire, um, the strip starts about here. The wires get soldered onto here 
and then the wire goes through that hole past that fillet and it's filleted on the other side and then the wire can go round into this clip this clip this clip this clip and actually the JST wires that I've got, I've got a pack of JST wires um, which are about as long as here and the, the connector comes to about here and the reason that I wanted to have a long wire that is clipped up rather than just having a connector here is just so it's you know if you were to pull this by accident it won't come out of here and put a strain on the solder joint um, also that's just the length they were so that's pretty handy what else is there to say about this design oh the nubs yeah so I'm pretty excited about these nubs I've called these nubs and um, this is a twist lock mechanism um, and I was inspired by a um, deodorant cap on a Sanex deodorant I bought in the shop and I just really love the way that the cap just kind of pushes down. I'll show you what I mean on this design. If we just look at the front plate, uh, we need to look on the inside of the front plate. So you see this height of this bar kind of changes and goes up here. And the reason for that is that the nubs on the first thing, where are they? These nubs here, that's not highlighting it, but these ones that follow that direction, which have ghosted out there, those nubs which end up fitting in there, well, when you bring it up to it, actually this, this is the top piece that you bring up to the other piece, but never mind, just it's in reverse. But when you bring it up, those nubs hit against this bit, and then when you twist it clockwise to do up, they drop down, and then that nub goes into there, and it has to get past this little bobble um, on all four, um, all four sides, well, as it were. And it has to get past that bobble. That there's a vertical piece on that nub that pushes past that bobble and that locks it in quite nice. It's a nice firm locking feel. You'll see as well that I'm that there's an angle, that, that filleted um, angle there. Um, in all other designs, I've done quite a lot of research on twist lock mechanisms and all other designs I found that didn't exist. It's usually a straight thing that comes out. Um, I'll show you on the back plate because it might be easier to see. Um, so yeah, that's chamfered on there as well. Um, that is horizontal on most other designs, but because it's a 3D printer, we needed to, um, what I actually I had it without a chamfer previously, um, but because it's a 3D printer, it prints from the bottom up. And of course, the, when it's laying down um, the plastic, it would be laying it down onto nothing. Um, and you can't have that kind of overhang because it's got nothing to go onto. Um, so it just it's not possible to print without supports between there and there. And the supports were really difficult to get out. They just did not work at all. However, I did them, I spent a long time trying to get the supports nice. And then in the end, I just thought, no, sack it. Change the design and make it so that um, you've got this angle so that obviously 3D printers can print with this angle. Um, and vice versa on the other one, which prints from the other direction. So that all worked out quite nicely. Any other features to show you here? I don't think so. I think that's pretty much it. Perhaps I'll discuss the design of the front plate, which is pretty... Well, it's nothing at the moment. Um, obviously, on the inside of here, we'll be attaching circuit boards and sensors and whatnot. Um, but one thing I should say is, if I just show you with them both together, when you look in here, you'll see a little gap between the two. That gap is where the LED strip goes. Um, and that gap can be increased. And what I was thinking of doing is having is removing this wall back up to about here, which is where the, you know, the twist lock mechanism comes to, i.e. pulling this face here upwards so that it's not as long, and then extending the diameter of this circle out to about here, and then having the wall coming down there. So you've got a kind of a double walled thing, the inside wall being just short enough to take the nubs, and the outside wall being the actual wall of it. And that would give a lot more space for air. Obviously, it makes it bigger, which is not ideal, but it'd give a lot more space for air to put um, the temperature, humidity, pressure sensor um, without the electronics of this interfering with the temperature sensing. Um, that will, um, And then air can kind of get under here and perhaps you put even some perforations. You can see it's doesn't go flush with the ceiling, so air will be able to hopefully freely flow there. That's the idea with that. So we get nice readings from the temperature sensor, and they're hidden. So the difficulty, obviously, is getting nice readings that are hidden, because obviously you could just punch a hole in that and whack your sensor through, but it looked rubbish, wouldn't it? So that is the idea with that. 
Um, also, what that might do is the LEDs will be shining essentially out towards this face here. And I have a feeling that because it's so close to the LEDs, um, it won't provide enough diffusion. So you'll see too much, um, you know, you won't see a nice diffuse light. Whereas if we bring that out a bit, it'll diffuse the light a bit. And we can play with the thickness of the material there to change diffusion. Um, so that, I think, covers the design of this in Fusion 360. So let's just have a, another final look at how it all fits together. So back to the bench, and this is how it works. Now I haven't fully clipped this up, um, and obviously when it's soldered in, it will be stuck down and clipped as well. So it's moving a bit, but just ignore that. Um, that obviously sits in the ceiling, and this goes up to it. Actually, let's just take this out, shall we? Um, you can see these clips just push out quite nicely. See that? They just come out, and that's what a clip looks like. And let's take this one out as well. Uh, like that. Yeah, I quite like that mechanism. Nice. Um, so you see it just kind of goes there. That upper section of the nub means that it goes down nice and flat. And as you twist, it kind of goes... Well, yeah, it kind of does. A bit tight. The tolerances are not quite right. Maybe I'll change that. Um, but that kind of pushes down and then... You hear this little click, and then it locks it in. And it feels quite snug, not too much rattle. And that's what it'll look like. Got some marks on here, but I'll probably sand those off or print it again. Um, we'll have a little PIR here. So yeah, onto the sensors. I, I kind of wanted to go with this idea. I bought this one and took the innards out. And I was gonna use this, but then just thought, now I'll design my own. Um, so the sensors that we're going to use are the AM312, which is, I believe that's what this one's called. Um, this comes off. That's good. That can, can super glue into the hole that I'll put in there. And then that slips on. And this I'm going to have probably on the circuit board. And the circuit board will have standoffs which can screw into this plate. And that'll just scooch into there. Um, so that's the PIR. We're going to have a. Um, just getting my sensors out of this box. I'll show you my little box of tricks. Yeah, so these microwave sensors. Um, this is the R uh, RCWL0516. And I've had a play with these. They're very, very sensitive. Um, and I might may not end up using. Well, I'll put them in, but I may not end up actually using the signal from this thing. Because it's so sensitive, um, the floors above, we've got joisted floors, so if anyone's walking on the floor above, it might set it off. But I'll have that there as an option, um, perhaps for use in certain situations. Um, and so that'll be microwave. Um, here we've got some little, um, this is CJMCU3216, so this is a I think this is called a gesture sensor, but it's an ambient light sensor. We've got this other ambient light sensor, I think it is. Oh no, sorry, this is the BMP180. Um, so this is a barometric pressure, but actually the BME180 has got pressure, temperature and humidity built in to the same thing. So I'll get some of those, I haven't got any of those. Um, this is a TEMT6000. Um, this is another ambient light sensor. And I probably end up not using that one because I think there's a better one out there. I'm not really sure. What else? Um, so yeah, we'll have ooh, a clap sensor or um, an, a room uh, ambient room noise sensor. I'm just walking across my room to pick up a little microphone that I can show you. Um, so let's just pull out my little box of tricks here, here. So, some LDRs in here which I won't be using. Yeah, these are little electric microphones which there's a great video by Great Scott on YouTube which talks about how he makes a clap sensor with these things. Um, and I plan to install, well, basically make my own 
noise sensor, which will have two outputs. One will be a trigger for something like a double clap, and one will just be ambient noise. So I took inspiration from um, a multi-sensor that's recently been put on the market by Loxone. And what that does, it uses the PIR to turn the lights on, and then it uses the ambient noise to confirm that there's someone still in the room. So that if you don't move, if you're watching a movie or whatever for two hours, it's, it keeps the lights on, it keeps them going, it extends the, 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 the trigger. I'll have them going into the ESP32, running TAS motor, and then the signals being sent to Node Red, and I'll use Node Red to you know determine the rules and the timings of what happens. Um, but I think that's quite a good way of working. So the PIR senses the initial movement, turns the lights on, and then the audio, um, the ambient noise, uh, extends the amount of time that the lights are on. Um, and then if for some reason they do go off, I'll have a separate clap, double clap, which will trigger them to come back on again. Um, obviously the light sensor will allow you to not have the lights too bright if it's already quite bright in there or if it's really really bright there's no need to turn the lights on at all. Um, so we've got temperature, humidity, pressure. We've got audio sensor with kind of two different types of audio that it's sensing. We've got the PIR, we've got the microwave sensor and we've got, have I said pressure temperature and humidity i can't remember i'm losing count now anyway but that's the plan so uh i hope you enjoyed this video and i will be releasing the designs once they're actually finished for the whole thing and then you can make it yourself so a quick light show um here you can see i've hooked up the led string um or the pixel ring rather to um, WLED, WLED, um, which is running in this case on an ESP01S. Um, it's got a megabyte of flash, so you get the full feature WLED. Um, however, it's not quite enough flash to um, provide for over the air upgrades. So I think if I did use the ESP01S, um, then I'd need to have some kind of headers on the board. But because it's such a nice quick release mechanism from the ceiling, it would be quite easy just to pull it down to do that. And I'll show you another animation. And here's another animation. Um, I think in this video I dim the lights after a few seconds. Um, there we go. Um, yeah, so this wasn't really designed as a night light, but actually I've, I've kind of held it up to the ceiling so far and it, it um, turned the lights off in the room. It does provide enough light to um give a nice gentle light across the whole room um i'm not sure every family member agrees with the use of this as a light um i quite like it as an optional thing anyway so thanks for watching